As we saw in the previous video, in 1598, Philip III inherited the most powerful kingdom in Europe. Spain's territories spread like tentacles from Iberia to Italy and the Netherlands. Yet just over a century later, Spain found itself weak and impoverished as the Bourbons took over from the Habsburgs as rulers. The reigns of just three kings, Philip III, Philip IV and Charles II, were decisive for the country's future. The question here is how Spain, Europe's leading power at the beginning of the 17th century, could be brought to its knees in just one century. Upon his accession to the throne, Philip III and his advisers sought to bring about a diplomatic turnaround, putting an end to the wars begun by Philip II and ushering Spain into an era of peace. To this end, the king signed a peace treaty with England in 1603, followed by a truce with the United Provinces in 1609. Philip III sought to safeguard Spain's European hegemony without using force. Diplomacy became his best asset. On the whole, Spain avoided declaring war during his reign, but did not hesitate to support the enemies of its rivals, encourage revolts among the latter, provide aid to its allies or develop its network of spies in the various European courts. At the same time, Spanish diplomats were sent to most European capitals, and even Protestant principalities received ambassadors. These ambassadors enabled the Spanish king to know everything that was happening on the continent, so that every troop movement or potentially dangerous action could reach the sovereign's ears. To ensure this peace, two Franco-Spanish marriages were decreed by the regent Marie de Medicis and Philippe III. Louis XIII married the Spanish Infanta, Anne of Austria, and the future Philippe the Fourth married Henri, the Fourth's daughter, Elizabeth de Bourbon. However, the king's diplomacy suffered two major setbacks. In Italy, a territory heavily dominated by Spain, the latter's hegemony was repeatedly challenged by the Republic of Venice and the Duchy of Savoy the latter even going to war for several years with its Spanish allies over the succession to Montferrat. In the colonies and on the seas, the Spaniards also experienced setbacks, since Philip II's failures against the English, Spanish and Portuguese ships were no longer safe, while some East Indian trading posts, such as Hormuz, were occupied by the Dutch and English. In any case, the death of Philip III in 1621 once again reshuffled the cards of Spanish diplomacy. Philip IV disagreed with his father's policy believing that Spain should impose itself through war. However, most of the king's advisers felt that the financial situation made such a project rather risky and unlikely to be put into practice. Since 1618, when the Thirty Years' War broke out, Europe had gradually been transformed into a gigantic powder keg, and all European states were forced to contribute, with varying degrees of success. Spain quickly established itself as a staunch supporter of the Austrian Emperor. Hardly surprising, given that both states were ruled by the Habsburgs. Philip IV sent troops and money to support his cousin in exchange for occupying Alsace, which enabled him to secure the road to the Netherlands a little more, in anticipation of a future war with the United Provinces. War with the latter resumed as early as 1621, with Spain achieving a number of successes in its wars against both the Protestant princes of the Empire and the Dutch. Between 1628 and 1631, Spain fought France on the Emperor's side in the War of the Mantuan Succession, which not only rekindled Franco-Spanish tensions, but quickly turned in Louis XIII's favour 
and ended in a clear French victory. In 1634, the Spanish and the Emperor won a decisive victory at Nördlingen over Protestant and Swedish troops, and the war seemed won for the Habsburgs as their enemies were crushed. Unfortunately, Louis XIII and Richelieu intervened, and in May 1635, a French emissary went to Brussels to announce France's declaration of war on the Spaniards. France then took on the role of protector of the German and Italian states in the face of Habsburg imperialism. Richelieu's intervention not only signaled the end of Habsburg's omnipotence in Europe, but also caused considerable instability in Iberia, as the royal power came up against several independence movements tired of war and excessive taxation. In 1640, Catalonia and Portugal declared their independence. In May, the people of Catalonia rose up and murdered Philip IV's representative in the region, while Philip's troops were defeated by the independence fighters in 1641, who recognized Louis XIII's French sovereignty in order to obtain help from France. At the same time, the regent of Portugal was imprisoned in December 1640, while the Portuguese nobility deposed Philip and appointed John IV as the new king. Portugal regained its independence that year, not least because Philip IV concentrated on reconquering Catalonia. In the end, these wars had catastrophic consequences for Spain at every level, and they ended one after the other from 1648 onwards. In the same year, Spain signed the Treaty of Münster, with the United Provinces, recognizing the Republic's independence and granting it certain trade concessions. In 1659, Philip signed the Treaty of the Pyrenees with France, with which France won Artois and Roussillon, while peace was secured by the marriage of the Infanta Maria Teresa to Louis XIV. Finally, in 1668, Portuguese troops crushed the Spanish army definitively establishing the country's independence. In the end, in the space of a single reign, Spain was completely ruined and lost many territories, but it remained a European power nonetheless. What is certain is that, from that moment on, Spain was no more than a colossus with feet of clay, while the death of Philip IV in 1665 confirmed the country's decline. As we saw in the last video, Philip II's reign began under the best economic auspices, with Iberian production doing well and colonial revenues substantial. When Philip III acceded to the throne in 1598, the situation was no longer quite the same, as the crown had run up huge debts during his father's reign, notably in his wars against France, the United Provinces and England. The Spaniards then faced two major economic crises, a fiscal crisis and a monetary crisis. The first was taxation, by which we mean the means used by the crown to collect money, and the Spanish kings were particularly inventive when it came to replenishing their coffers. These were generally intended to last only a few years, but it was not uncommon for them to be renewed. These exceptional taxes accounted for a large proportion of the crown's income, up to 30% in 1621. But when these weren't enough, royalty knew how to be more original. It didn't hesitate to confiscate cargoes of goods from the Indies, force certain loans, encourage generous donations to the crown, and much more. In fact, the crown's revenues rose from 9 million ducats in 1584 to 20 million in 1645. Yet revenues were still too low and the debt continued to grow. The crown even declared bankruptcy twice in 1607 and 1627. In addition to insufficient taxation, there was an unprecedented currency crisis. Overall, the crown made copper and silver coins, which were generally used to trade within the country, lose their value. To this end, 
it withdrew the silver portion and produced coins entirely in bronze, a process that enabled it to make more profit from coin production but to the detriment of merchants. At the same time, certain periods saw a very large number of coins being minted, creating high inflation. As such, the crown sank into a vicious circle of currency devaluation and inflation, leading domestic trade into a complicated situation while workers were paid with coins that had almost no value. The reigns of Philip III and Philip IV thus saw the Iberian Peninsula impoverished. Yet these phenomena were far from sufficient to sink Europe's leading power. The real catastrophe arrived with the birth of the long-awaited heir in 1661. It wasn't wars, revolts or famines that brought down the Habsburgs of Spain, but a much more deeply rooted evil, still unknown at the time. In 1526, Charles V married his cousin. In 1570, Philip II married his niece. In 1599, Philip III married his cousin. And in 1649, Philip IV married his niece. The Habsburgs of Spain and Austria thus became accustomed to intermarrying in order to strengthen their political and dynastic ties. At the time, the dangers of consanguinity were still unknown. It was this inbreeding that gave the Habsburgs such a distinctive portrait, a prominent jaw, swollen lower lip and downward pointing nose. Attributes that were repeated generation after generation and which became more pronounced the higher the level of inbreeding. In 1661, when the long-awaited heir was born, the Habsburgs had crossed the red line. Charles II had a consanguinity rate of 25%, the same as a child born of a brother and sister or a father and daughter. The child is nicknamed the Bewitched, suffers from epileptic seizures and mental retardation, has difficulty expressing himself, can't walk until he's eight and never learns to write, a condition that worsens throughout his life. Worst of all, he was impotent and therefore unable to provide the kingdom with an heir, even though he was the only living son of Philip IV, the only hope of his dynasty. Inland, Charles's inability to reign put councils and certain strongmen at the head of the country, and numerous power struggles tore the government apart. On the other side of the Pyrenees, Louis XIV strengthened absolutism and gave France an efficient government capable of making long-term decisions. While Spain was sinking, the Kingdom of France was flourishing economically with Colbert's reforms and militarily with the actions of Louvois and Vauban. What's more, as soon as Philip IV died in 1665, the European powers expected the new king to die soon, given his numerous health problems, which is why in 1668, France and Austria agreed to partition the Spanish Empire. However, despite all predictions, Charles II did not die prematurely. In fact, he reigned for 35 years. By 1667, European domination had shifted definitively from the Spanish to the French crown. That year, Louis XIV declared war on Charles II, using as a casus belli the non-payment of the dowry of his wife, the Spanish Infanta Maria Teresa, which had been promised in the Treaty of the Pyrenees. Madrid was unable to react, and many fortresses in the Netherlands and Franche-Comté were quickly occupied by France before a peace was signed the following year. Louis XIV won 11 Flemish strongholds, including Lille. In 1672, France attacked the United Provinces. Once again, the country was well prepared and won major victories 
So Austria and Spain entered the war alongside the Dutch. Unfortunately for them, the war was a success for Louis XIV, while Spain was the big loser. It was forced to cede Franche-Comte and 12 Flemish strongholds to the French. France then faced a large European coalition in 1689, following the Wars of Reunions, which enabled it to lay its hands on Alsace. Spain again suffered from this conflict. Finally, it was the death of Charles II in 1700 that brought the Spanish Empire to an end. However, in order to avoid a total dismantling of the country, Charles's advisers designated the Duc d'Anjou, Louis XIV's grandson, as the new King of Spain, in the hope that the King of France would fight rather than partition the Spanish territories with the Emperor. They chose the Duc d'Anjou, despite the Franco-Spanish rivalry, because Louis XIV was the only European prince with the means to fight a coalition. While the whole continent awaited his decision, he finally chose, after much reflection, to accept Charles II's will and support his grandson. The War of the Spanish Succession began, with the whole of Europe joining forces to prevent the Bourbons from gaining control of the Spanish territories. France suffered greatly from this war, but Louis XIV refused to turn against his grandson in exchange for peace. The war continued until 1713, when the English and Dutch decided to sign a peace treaty. The treaties of Utrecht, signed in 1713, and of Rastatt, signed in 1714, put a definitive end to the conflict. Louis XIV's grandson, Philip V, was recognized by all as King of Spain. But the empire relinquished Gibraltar and Menorca to the English, Sicily to the Savoyards and the Netherlands, Milan, Naples and Sardinia to the Austrians. The Spanish Empire was thus partitioned, losing all its ties outside Iberia in the space of a single reign, but gaining a capable sovereign in Philip V, who would later restore the kingdom's prestige and its place among the European powers. As we have seen, Philip III succeeded his father in 1598. He reigned for 22 years before handing over to his son Philip IV. For a long time, these two men were considered lazy kings and accused of having caused the decline of Spain. But the reality is obviously more complex, if only because the latter relied on favorites to rule, just as Louis XIII relied on Richelieu at exactly the same time. Moreover, these kings had to rule when the economic and diplomatic context of the time was clearly not favorable. It was this overall situation that gradually led Spain into decline. But in the end, it was the reign of Charles II and above all his numerous health problems that led Spain to its downfall. The weakness of the Habsburgs' power and their subsequent demise unfortunately led to the country's dismantling in 1714. From Europe's leading power, Spain was transformed in just one century into a secondary power, which would later regain its letters of nobility under the Bourbons. But that's another story. Mm -hmm.